Now we're carrying on our study in 1 Corinthians and we get in verse 10 through really verse 17 is our text for this morning. And the Apostle Paul is laying out the problem. He's going to deal with five major problems before he addresses their questions starting in chapter 7. So he, he's going to address the kind of the issues, the problems that he had heard from one of the members of Chloe's household. And the first problem he's going to address is this fraction or disunity that they're experiencing. Some say I'm a Paul, some say I'm of Apollos, and, and they're disagreeing over this. And what Paul does is in these first few verses from verse 10 through 17, he's, he's going to diagnose the problem. He's going to tell us why they're disagreeing over who is the more important preacher or pastor. Begin re reading with me in verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you agree and that there'll be no division among you, but you should be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you, are, you say, I follow Paul or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, that's Peter, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Cephas, Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Now we think through this, he's telling us why they're divided. He's not just saying they are divided, but he's going to diagnose the problem. It's amazing that the Apostle Paul is like a physician or a doctor that takes his client or the patient into his room and says, you know, you're having these symptoms. And the symptoms are just something indicating that there's something deeper wrong. Now, I'm not going to focus simply on the symptoms. I'm going to diagnose the cause that's producing the symptoms. Now, the symptoms here is that some say I'm a Paul, and some say I'm a Paulus, and some say I'm a Cephas, and some say I'm a Christ. That's the symptom. Uh, this is this argument that they're having that's dividing them. That's not the problem. Now, it is a problem. It's causing quarrels and fights and feuding. It's causing division in the church, disunity. That's a huge problem. But there's a deeper problem. Oh, has to identify that. And he's going to identify where this comes from. Now, I want you to start thinking, when you become disgruntled with the church or you get in a particular clique and you say, I'm with these people, I'm on this side, or, or maybe it's our care groups, I'm a part of this care group and not that care group, or I like Pastor Ryan or Pastor Tommy, or I'm a Pastor Jeff, and you get into this kind of a cliquish mindset and which puts you at odds with those that are not in the clique or in the group. What causes that? Where did, where did that type of mindset come from where you have those who are in and those who are out and those who are to be preferred and those who are to be, if you would, shun or demoted in some way in your mind? Where does that come from? And, and generally speaking, where does disunity come from in your life. You, when James is addressing this in his epistle, he says, where does quarrels and fights and feuds come from among you? And he diagnoses uh, the outward fighting with internal desires for this world. You lust and you do not have. You want more of this world and you're craving the world, but the world is not satisfying you. So there's a deep-seated dissatisfaction in your heart. And because you're miserable, that misery because you can't get the world that you want, that you're miserable is leading you to fight among yourselves. 
that misery is, if you would, is bleeding out in your, into your relationships. You need to be content with what you have. And satisfied with what you have is only when you're satisfied with what you have that you're going to have better, more peaceful relationships. So where does this discontentment come, if you would, in the church where people would say, hey, I'm a Paul, or I'm of Cephas, or I'm of Peter, or, or Peter or Cephas is the same person, or I'm of Christ. Where does this come from? And you've got to realize that I think uh, contextually that Paul is adding Cephas and Jesus in there, and that really wasn't who they were siding with at all. He's using that as an illustration. I'm, I like the Apostle Peter better. I like the Apostle Paul Peter better. Or I like our current pastor, Apollos. Uh, or I like Christ. That's the highest one. I'm of Christ. Well, in reality, what's going on, it's a division over two people. It's a division over who was the better or is the better pastor. Now, the Apostle Paul was the founding pastor of the Church of Corinth. He founded it in the year 50 on his second missionary journey, and he stays there for 16 months, which is unusual for Paul to stay in a place for so long. But Paul said, Paul was told by God, don't be scared of, of this place, of Corinth. I have many people there. So he stayed a, a year and a half. He, he basically is the founding pastor, and he's there long enough to get to know these people and these people to love him and he to love these people. And then persecution does hit, and he flees, and he goes back to Jerusalem on his way to Ephesus. And there he meets Apollos on his journey back, and he says, listen, Paulus, you could be a help to me if you go back to Corinth, where I just left, and you can help out Corinth. And that's what he did. Of course, Aquila and Priscilla came with Paul to Ephesus. Aquila and Priscilla taught Apollos more perfectly in the, in the way. And the, it says in Acts about Apollos that he was a man of, with mighty words. He was an eloquent man. This man was a preacher. He was the prince of preacher of that day. He was the Charles Spurgeon, if you would. And so Apollos goes back to Corinth, or goes to Corinth, and he settles there and becomes their second pastor. The church of Corinth receives him well, and he pastors there for a good while, and Paul comes back to Ephesus, and he stays in Ephesus for three years, from around 52, 53, 54, and about the time of 55, which is about five years after the founding of the church of, of Corinth, he, Chloe comes, or one of the members of Chloe's household comes with some problems, and he had written a previous letter, and they sent a letter back asking some questions. So there's like six questions, four or five major problems, and Paul pens this letter, and he's going to address the number one problem, which he spends one-fourth of the letter, um, four whole chapters, if you would, on this problem. And, it, and it's, it comes down to that they're arguing among themselves which pastor do they like best. Do they like Apollos, or do they like the apostle Paul. Now, I'm under the impression, based upon how Paul addresses the problem, that the majority of the church of Corinth was siding with Apollos. Uh, it's like, I don't know the percentage. Well, there's probably no way of knowing exactly what percentage, but it does seem that the majority of them were siding with, you, with, Apoll with, uh, with loving Apollos more than Paul, because Paul has to defend himself and he doesn't really have to defend Apollos. And, and that carries over into his second epistle. That, that there's, he's being discredited. And we learn from the internal evidence that he's being discredited as a pastor because he wasn't as eloquent. He wasn't as gifted speaker as Apollos. And, and based upon how he's addressing the problem of disunity. It's all about this showing how eloquent wisdom is not what makes a good preacher. That's not what is a good evaluation of 
a man of God, how well he speaks. You know, we all tend to do that. I, I do that to myself. We want to be polished when we speak. Uh, we don't want to make verbal blunders. Uh, and we begin to judge our favorite preachers sometimes are not on the content in which it's being spoken, but on how it's being spoken, how entertained we may be, how impressed we may be by how they say it. Because you can light up a bunch of pastors and there's going to be a varied in their giftedness, their natural gifting, not necessarily a spiritual gifting, but a natural gifting. And there are going to be some speakers or preachers that are easier to listen to, more enjoyable to listen to, and others not so much. And apparently the Apostle Paul wasn't a gifted speaker. We, I'm not just saying that. He says it about himself. First Corinthians 2 says, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come for claiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or with wisdom. And 2 Corinthians 10.10, 10, it's the same issue still going on. He says, for this they say, his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is of no account. You know, his preaching is just nothing to write home about. That's what they're saying about it. And 2 Corinthians eleven six. although I'm not a polished speaker, I'm certainly not lacking in knowledge. So they're evaluating their first pastor in light of their second pastor. And frankly, they're just more impressed with Apollos than they are with Paul. Now, Paul has to write back, how in the world would you address this issue if you happen to be Paul? wait a minute, that's not fair. I, don't judge me so harshly. I mean, it would be very difficult if this was happening to you and you had some other preacher that everybody liked better than you and you have to somehow address this, but how do you do it without trying to brag on yourself or be proudful or be, it's about, hey, my feelings are hurt. I don't think Paul has hurt feelings here. I don't think this is a matter of trying to elevate himself and push down a polis. It's a gospel issue for Paul. So he has to acknowledge this. He has to address this. If something's not right about this. And he's, he's, he's a master at diagnosing the problem. He's like this amazing counselor that can say, okay, listen, I know this is involving me. And I don't want to, in any way, say something's wrong with Apollos. He's not going to start saying Apollos is, he shouldn't preach so well. He's not going to discredit Apollos. So somehow he's got to address this problem. And he does it in three ways. One, he, well, you could say in four ways. One, he acknowledges the symptom. The symptom is this division and quarreling and fighting among themselves of who do they like better? Who's their favorite preacher? Who do they like to follow? Who would they prefer to listen to? Who would they prefer to be their pastor? But then he, he slowly goes, behind that division is this problem. And behind that problem is this problem. Then in verse 17 at the end, he underlines the root problem. So this is caused by this, this is caused by this, but the heart of all this comes from this. So let's look at this, and this is his appeal to unity. Look at verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I love when Paul does this. He says, I'm making an appeal to you, I'm calling you, and I'm not doing it for my sake. This is not about, hey, I'm the old pastor, because if you love me at all, don't be fighting about us. He says, no, if you love Christ at all, I appeal to you on his name. I'm, I'm looking at a higher reason to cause you to motivation. Now, let me do that right now. If there's any seed of disunity in your heart right now towards this church or to a brother or sister in the Lord, if you have any ounce of some form of like, I'm not perfectly in fellowship with this or that person, that that's how you feel. 
on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ, let me appeal on to you. If you love Jesus Christ, if he's at all important to you, then seek unity. Seek unity. You know, remember what Paul says? He tells us in Ephesians, endeavor, endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That word endeavor means to strive, or some would say to make every effort, do all that is in your power to live peacefully. It, and I'm going to just be honest with you, it's, it starts with your mind. It starts with um, getting things right in your, in your thinking. Um, and so endeavor to make sure that you're maintaining the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So Paul is calling on the Corinthians. They're split apart, maybe in four groups, but at least in two major groups. They're split apart from one another, and if things don't get corrected, they're going to have four churches, and every one of them is going to be unhealthy. Every one of them would be started the wrong way. Now, that's not the answer. If we don't agree, let's just move on. No, there's a solution, and the solution is understanding the problem. And so let's look at the problem, and this is called a unity, and I got three points. It, 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 this it, call to unity has three ingredients to how we resolve our fractions and disunity. One, finding unity in sound doctrine. Two, finding unity in Jesus Christ. And three, finding unity in the gospel. First of all, we see in verse 10 that this is a call to find unity and oneness in sound doctrine. Look at verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Basically, don't disagree. Quit disagreeing with one another. I mean, you ever heard the phrase, doctrine divides, love unites? Well, that's the motif and theme of most modern churches. We don't want to have sound doctrine because doctrine is going to splinter us up into different groups. Uh, and so we want to have open doors, open minds, and open hearts is the tagline of one denomination. Open minds, which means we are not, we don't have any strong conclusions. We're not dogmatic about anything at this church. We want to be uh, loving, which means in today's language, loving means affirming. We affirm your lifestyle. We affirm your behavior. We affirm your thinking. So we're not here to redirect your thoughts, not to correct your false doctrine. And we're here to love you and to affirm you, to accept you. It's love that matters. And so we want unity by, by this universal affirmation. But we all know that that doesn't produce unity. Uh, all it does is bring in a bunch of people that are not unified together under one roof. It's a superficial unity at best. This is not we all agree to disagree type exhortation. So we say we just need to forget our differences and get along. And that's not what Paul's saying here. What if he just said, hey, I know some of you like me, some of you like Apollos. Y'all don't worry about that. Just quit talking about it. Just don't talk about it anymore. You can have your favorite preacher, that's fine, but just don't divide about it. He doesn't say that. He says, y'all, get on the same page here. Be in agreement about this. Quit uh, having different judgments. In fact, he uses three phrases to talk about this. Have the same mind and the same judgment. Amos 3, 3 says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? 2 Corinthians 13, 11, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice, strive for restoration, encourage one another to be of one mind. Philippians 2, 2, make my joy complete and being like-minded, having the same love, being one spirit and of one mind. I mean, we're not going to have unity until we're in agreement. And ultimately, 
perfect unity is when we get to heaven where there's simply no disagreements. There's no doctrinal divisions. I want to be clear here. It's not doctrine that divides. It's like saying sin divides, like saying holiness divides. Doctrine doesn't divide. You know what divides? False doctrine. Errors divide. Wrong thinking divides. Holiness doesn't divide. Sin divides. False teaching leads to sin. Errors lead to divisions. We could go to Ephesians 4, and Ephesians 4 is this exhortation to speak the truth in love so that we may not be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine going back and forth, but that rather we come together in unity and grow in unity rather than being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. So don't have in your mind that, hey, for a church to be unified, it needs to have low doctrinal standards or to minimize truth. It's only as collectively we come uh, in more, or more in agreement with sound doctrine are we going to be more and more unified. Imagine you and your spouse only agreeing about one or two things in life and wonder how unified you would be as a family. No, for you to be one flesh and be really unified, you want your, your minds to be one. Maybe not on every single issue, but it needs to be on a lot of the issues. Now, I'll get in a minute and I'll warn us of being overly critical about tertiary issues to where we can't fellowship with anybody. I'll make that disclaimer in a minute. But we're prone to, you know, go from no doctrinal instruction is needed for unity. And Paul doesn't say that. Paul doesn't say, just quit talking about this issue. He, he's like telling them, come together and think the same, have the same judgment about the issues. So doctrine unites. Uh, we need sound doctrine. We need more doctrine. But not, it's not all that we need. The second thing we need to be unified, we need to be unified in Christ. Um, we see this in 13 through 16. What was going on in Corinth was they were making secondary issues or secondary issues. I and mean, even important things, they were making it primary. We see in 1 Corinthians 3, 5, Paul's rephrasing the same problem. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but God who gives the growth. So he's, he's reducing the, this dilemma and this argument down to two people. And that's why I don't think Peter and Jesus is the principal uh, sides here. It comes down to their pastors, their first pastor, the second pastor. And Paul says, you know, I planted, Paulus watered. He's, he's uh, talking about their pastorals. The first one watered, I mean planted, the second one watered. He said, either the planter or the waterer or nothing, or nothing. It is God who gives the increase. See, Paul is correcting this thinking that you got too much importance upon the messenger. You're placing too much importance on the preacher and not enough importance upon the God behind the preacher. It's not the preacher's ability to give increase. Paul could not convert anyone. Apollos could not sanctify anyone. They're incapable of doing the work that they're called to do. They're called to proclaim the Word of God, but it's only God, it's only Christ that can change lives. It's only Christ that can that can cause people to be born again and to be sanctified. I, I, I can testify to you if it was in my power in my speaking ability, which I would be so scared if it was in my speaking ability, because I know I fell in that area. I know I stumble over my words. I have 
A lot of times I mispronounce words and I don't even know I do it until my wife tells me on the way home. You know, I, if it was just in the ability of preaching, oh, I couldn't do it. Who could do it? But sometimes we're, we're tempted to think, oh, if we could just hear Charles Spurgeon preach, then we'd have conversions. Maybe it would be John Bunyan or or maybe if it would be the Apostle Paul himself or Apollos, if we could just get him behind the pulpit. You know, the problem of our church, we just need a better preacher. I'm going to tell you something. I tell myself, I need to tell myself this. I, I can't do anything. It, 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 we can plant, we can water, right? But only God changes lives. And what the Corinthians were doing, they was putting too much focus upon the messenger and not the message. Too much focus on the steward and not the gift that was being stewarded. They were focused on, and not, not, it's not important. It's not that the apostle Paul's not important or Paulus is not important. Pastors are important. In fact, Paul says later on, he says, I was a master builder. I, I built on Christ. And those are, some will come after me and built on what I laid. And he calls himself a master builder. He's, he's saying, hey, that's important. But he says in 1 Corinthians 4, 6, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit so that you may know, you may learn from us not to go beyond what is written. Then you will take no pride in one man over another. See, I'm, I'm applying this to me and Apollos so that you don't think too highly of us, so that you think that we are the ones that are bringing about salvation or sanctification. It's not in us. And so this is what is going on in the church of Corinth. They were taking uh, pastors, which are important, secondary issues, if you would, and elevating it above Christ. Um. And this is why, in verse 13, Apostle Paul says, is Christ divided? You're dividing up the church, but is Christ divided? And then he goes on to say, was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I mean, you think about the beginning of their conversion. The argument for the Apostle Paul was, hey, he's our founding pastor. We were converted under his ministry. And then the other argument from the for Apollos is like, hey, we're sanctified under his ministry, and he's a better preacher. Paul was the one we've learned about. So Paul is addressing this, saying, hey, did I baptize you? Did you begin because I died for you? Was it with, was it me on the cross? No, I thought it wasn't me. You wasn't converted to Jeff. I mean, to the Apostle Paul, or you're not converted to Jeff Johnson. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except to see this and Gaius, so that no one may say that they were baptized in my name. I'm not, Paul said, I'm not trying to build a, a following of disciples for Paul. I'm not building a church around my name. He says, I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. He's not saying it's wrong to baptize people, just saying that's not, that's not, that's not what makes a church. So I didn't come to baptize. Don't uh, put an overemphasis upon the particular pastor that particularly led you to the Lord. Now, so you got this arguments going on. I like my founding pastor, or I like this better. My second pastor is a much better preacher. Got that going on, and the Apostle Paul is saying, your focus is on the wrong thing. Your focus is on secondary issues. Often when we divide among ourselves, if we be honest, the thing that gets us upset and makes us want to leave a church is a secondary issue. And I'm not saying it's not an important issue, right? But it's amazing when an important issue can so dominate our thinking, we, we, all we can think about it is that. And we get so fixed on it, we think that if that's not right, that everything else is wrong. It's like, wait a minute, our priority's out of place. So if we're going to uh, have a, 
uh, unity. We also, we need to have sound doctrine. So let's not minimize that. But let's be careful that we don't place secondary things above primary things. Taking pastors and put them above Christ. We're only going to be of the same mind if we see that Christ is our unity. Christ is not divided. Christ has one body. There's one Lord. And all of us here today, all of us here today, and no matter what little minor differences or even some important differences that we have among ourselves, there's one thing that is in common to us all, if we, indeed we are Christians. Christ is our Lord. Now, we can fight and feud when all is well, comfortable. In fact, often easy times lead us to, to focus on uh, this issue or that issue and, and elevate the issues of, that's important to us above more important issues. We can do that, but what happens when trials come? When the world is falling apart, the whole world hates the church of the living God. And you have two people who differ. I'm of Paulus. I'm of Paul. They differ about that. Do you think the world cares about that difference? They hate you both. And so when these two people are in prison for their love for the Lord, you see, it, it shows, it's like, wait a minute. This is not all that important anymore. I'm not saying we don't work out the little details. I'm not saying we shouldn't fix problems in the church. I'm not saying that, that there's not problems in the church. But you know, if Christ remains the, our focus and the focus of the church, then there can be unity among even those who disagree. That's what Paul is doing. Now, notice this. He's not saying, y'all be of the same, same mind, either agree with that Paul or Apollos is better. Just pick one. As long as you agree, <laughs> as long as you all like Apollos and everybody's united around Apollos, then hey, there's unity. You know, he's not saying that. Even there's still a problem if the unity is on Apollos. There's still a problem if the unity is focused upon Paul. The solution is not one or the other. The solution is get back to Christ. I find that Christ is our unity. Christ is not divided. You see, in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, nor slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Ten years ago, I went to a conference in one particular notable preacher preached an amazing sermon that our unity is Jesus Christ. And I thought it was one of the best sermons I've heard on the topic. Sadly, that same preacher about, what, about three or four or five years ago getting, began to make critical race theory the essence of unity and been, began to divide with brothers and sisters over that, over race. And I thought to myself, he completely is undermining what he once preached. But we all are tempted to do that. We, we all know that Christ is our, is our unity. I'll, I'll give you this illustration um, and move on to my last point. When I was in college, I, I, I took a trip to Connecticut. And I was surprised how godless that state was and no doubt still is. I went to UCA, which is the big university in the town here. And there is, I don't know if you know this, but back 20 years ago when I was in school there, or 25, years, 25, 30 years ago, um, there was probably 100 million Christian ministries on campus. You walk over here, you run into this Baptist student union, run over there, it's the Methodist student union, you run over here, there's another, you, you know, I'm like, wow, you could have a free meal every day of the week going to these. And uh, I, I'm not saying I didn't do that, but 
there is just it's just a Christian Christianity kind of and I'm not saying the UCA is Christian as a lot of unbelievers most of them were unbelievers but hey there were a lot of Christian ministries everywhere well I went to Connecticut with a friend who was uh, enrolled at University of Bridgeport Connecticut and I went with him to help him settle down into his uh, dormitory and I was there on the first week of school for one week and I said I'm going to find the Christian ministry I find a Christian ministry well there's only one at the time only one Christian ministry on the University of Bridgeport I'm there first day of the week uh, two people showed up besides me and I mean this it, there was three of us and I was about to leave you know and there was this Chinese Sari Pong I don't know if, if she was Chinese or <laughs> someone from your area of the woods I, I don't know I just assumed she was from China um, and um, Sari Pong says we Americans always uh, say everybody from is from China well they're maybe not okay this this older lady it was an older lady dropping her daughter off to school it flew over and and um, she didn't speak a bit of English now our daughter does and uh, I noticed the older lady so she was gonna leave I was gonna leave and the daughter was gonna be left alone and um, the older lady had a uh, what I assumed to be a Chinese Bible and it had uh, she had that in her hands and she looked at me and could not speak a bit of English not one word of English and I couldn't speak her language and she just looked at me and she knew the word Bible she goes Bible Bible that's all she said Bible and she held it like this Bible I didn't have to speak the language to know that I was one with her. There is a unity deeper, deeper than ethnicity. Language is a unity that only Christ can bring. She had a love for Jesus Christ, the Word of God, and it was evident. And I had one too. And our heart, it's like the Lord knitted our hearts together in such a way. It was impressionable upon me as a young man. I was impressed. I was like, Dad, I, that's my sister in Christ. I knew it. I said, well, that's all subjective. Yes, it's subjective, but real. Sometimes we forget that. We forget that in churches. We forget that the cause of unity is what we all count dear. Now, you who are arguing with different people, maybe it's on social media or online, just remember this. Is your argument causing you to not love a brother and sister in Jesus Christ? Then you're holding your argument wrongly. Do you not love those who Christ died for? You're holding your argument wrongly. If, if you're going to say, I'm a Paul, I'm a Paulist, and you're going to split over this and say, I can't meet with them, and that's that group, then you're holding it wrongly. If you have favorite preachers that lead you to not associate with other churches or other men of God and women of God, then you're holding your doctrine wrongly. Yes, there's a place to differ, a place to talk about things, there's a place to, uh, to debate, but there's never a place not to love God's people. Ever. Remember that. Remember that. In this church, let's, let's say we know everybody's a true Christian, we don't know that, but let's say if you're a true Christian, you love Jesus. Then how can I not love you? How can I not be united to you? 
This is where Paul's diagnosing the problem, and he's getting it. It's like you're, you're strayed from Christ in this division. Now, there's one more thing, he, he, and this is the root of the problem. He comes to verse 17, and he, he reduces the diagnosis down to the, the root issue. Yeah, it's amazing how he does this. The reason they were divided in their disagreement is because they were making secondary issues primary. But the reason they were making secondary issues pastors more important than Christ is because they placed the power in the preacher, not in the gospel. Look at verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. No, it's about, it'd be like comparing Jeff Johnson with Charles Spurgeon. Me, a poor preacher, Spurgeon, an awesome preacher. And go, there's just no comparison between the two. There's not. I'm, I'm, none of us really heard Spurgeon preach, but we've heard that it was amazing. And I sure would love to go back in time and listen to him, no doubt. And we go, okay, if, if we just had someone like that, then there would be conversions. It would really be a work of God if we had a, a, a man who could really be clear and precise in his words and, and, and preach us and teach in a way that is, that is, that's powerful. And we, it's the, the wrong thinking. And here's the problem with the Corinthians. This is the reason I think the majority of them were going with Apollos because the next three chapters is trying to correct this. The idea that the power is in the eloquence of the preacher. In the ability of the preacher to talk people into conversion. It's the ability of the preacher and his lofty words and the, the order of his words and the eloquence in which he says that to be able to talk people into sanctification and move the needle of spirituality in the right direction. It's not it. It's not it. Now he goes, now we're going to go over these in the year, weeks ahead. There's like 10 reasons why that's not the case. 10 reasons why God didn't choose eloquence and philosophy and and external things that the world values he shows the foolishness of preaching paul says i didn't come with mighty words and it's like i, I purposely didn't I, if i could he probably he couldn't have done it if he wanted to but i didn't choose to do that i wasn't striving for that he says unless the gospel is nullified of its power um 1 Corinthians 2, 1, he goes on to say, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of our God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. I know what that means to tremble before you preach. Oft before I preach, I'm in the back room at the point of tears sometimes. I was with you with weakness and fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom. I, I didn't come that way. I, and, and it's like, it, what's so scary about this is like the thing you need. I say, I preach to myself, I'm saying this to me. What you need when you preach is what you don't have of yourself. You can't drum it up. You know, I, I, I could get more emotional it, it, just being pure, raw emotions is not going to change your life. I can try to be more argumentative. I can be more persuasive in my arguments, maybe get my words fixed a little bit better. And uh, I want to have good servants, but I, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything. I, 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 remember, I remember a sermon just a couple months ago that I prayed and prayed and prayed in preparation for the sermon. And I got up here and I wept. Before you, I preached before you, and I was looking at the people that I wanted to be converted. I, I then watched them play football afterwards.
guys, we don't need, we don't need in the church, we don't need professionalism. We don't need just someone who knows how to speak well. We don't need all the notes on the piano to be right on tune and all the words to be precisely pronounced. We need power. We need the work of God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4.20, For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk or with words, but with power. 1 Thessalonians 1.5, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. We need preaching that comes with power, with change, with transformation. The Apostle Paul was a weak, unimpressive preacher, but when he preached, people were converted. People were sanctified. They were transformed, not by his speaking ability, but by the power of the gospel. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'll preach that for it. The gospel, not the preacher. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. He says, I didn't come with eloquent wisdom. Let the cross of Christ or the gospel be emptied of its power. I didn't want you to be impressed with me. You would be my disciple. Old lady came to Spurgeon and says, I saw one of your disciples at the park drunk as he could be. Spurgeon says, it must be my disciple. If it was Christ's disciple, he wouldn't have been. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, When I came to you, brothers, I did not, chapter 2, verse 1, come claim to you the testament of God with lofty speech or wisdom. He says, my speech and message were in, was not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. And this is why. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. A preacher is well worth his salt, doesn't want to hear or doesn't need to hear that was a good sermon. You know, you really kept my attention today, Pastor. Man, you nailed that one. That, that can lift up and make the preacher feel, I really did well today. You know what a preacher wants to hear? Or at least, I want to hear this. I heard from God today. God spoke to me today. Or, you know, Pastor, I've got to quit this in my life. Oh, I didn't even bring that up. I know, but God made it evident that this was wrong. I want to thank you. It's like, no, it wasn't me. I didn't even know you are dealing with that. That's what we need. So here's the problem, and, and he's going to go on to give, I think, around nine or ten reasons why not to uh, over-elevate preachers and their preaching abilities. This idea of philosophy and eloquence, all that he's going to dismantle for the next three and a half chapters as we go on. But we want to know that we're disciples of Christ. As a church, what will keep us united is not gimmicks, games, ministries, personalities, ethnicities, hobbies. We're not a cowboy church, hipster church, or this church, or that church. That's not going to keep us united. What will unite, and the only thing that's going to unite a church, is the power of the gospel. We must have it. I want to end... Hey, I got a clock. <laughs> See, it, it turns off on me, guys. Okay. Um, I want to end with this. I know there's a big, um, there's a big debate going on in Christendom, and you're, most of you are probably unaware of it. But there's a big social media debate raging among conservative 
evangelical, like-minded Christians over this topic of Christian nationalism. And there's sides, there's, there's t- people on both sides, good people on both sides of the issue. Good people on both sides of the issue. I have my own view of the topic. But what disturbs me is the, the uncharitableness of it. It's like we're taking a secondary issue and, and, and elevating it where we're forgetting to law. We're forgetting the primary thing of, of, of who we are as Christians. And so in response, and I did it somewhat intentionally, because I have friends on both sides of this debate. I said, well, both sides, this is what I've been thinking, both sides of this debate agree that we need revival. Now, they have differences of how the church and state relate to one another, but both sides, at least from my friendships go, believe that no matter what we need, it's going to have to be through the work of the Holy Spirit. That legislation is not going to bring revival. The work of the Spirit through the gospel is going to revive, bring revival. So it's my hope to bring some form of unity between these factious groups by calling our attention back to the power of the gospel. That this is what we need more than anything is the work of God in our life. So I, I want to ask you to join me and, and, and for our church sake, that our church does not lose focus of the gospel and that, that God, uh, each time we meet is my prayer. I want it to be your prayer that you would come here. I'm ready to hear from the Lord, not from the, the preacher. I'm ready to, to hear from the Lord. And I believe I don't know who would be the worst. Get one of our seminary students up here. Who's the worst preacher we have among them? It, maybe it's me. <laughs> if you came with a heart to hear God and the word of God was faithfully proclaimed, you could leave changed. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we do want to be unified around the right things. We want to be of the same mind. Lord, we do pray that the Word of God, even today's Word, not by the efficacy of my own preaching ability or gifting, but that you would use clay vessels, broken vessels, that the, the power not, that be evident that the power is not in us. You've chosen the foolishness of the world. You've chosen the base things. You've chosen poor speakers like myself to demonstrate your power so that our faith is not in the man, but in the word of God, in Christ. Lord, help us to remain focused. Help us to hear from you, to be changed by you. Help our church to have the power of God manifested through the means of the preaching of the word. This we pray in your son's name. Amen.